how they would revise, whether it's the sciences, urban planning, public health, etc. Other thing, I'll say one. I'll, uh, we talked earlier this morning around uh, about um, with a smaller group about um, social engagement, needing also the skills of sociality <laughs> about how about how um, artists trained trained in particular fields then need to think about what it means to talk to people or what it means to elicit um, conversation. And the particular thing for there of, of having um, uh, Michael and Sean talk about the story circle or about the open process and to talk about the, um, the method of inquiry and interviewing and eliciting conversation itself being a skill that it doesn't just sort of happen. Um, uh, but that it also seems to be something when we're talking about artists needing to reskill to do this kind of work. That seems one of them. Anything else you remember? Yeah, um, the sort of dichotomy or split between like excellence being like a polished performance and excellence in inquiry. Um, I think that's like a really, mm -hmm. especially for like visual arts, that's probably a big question. Does, does it feel that that's more of an issue in the visual arts? Can you say what you mean? Oh, um, I think that it's. Uh, like the standards for excellence and polish are maybe higher in visual arts or maybe more codified in a lot of arts. Uh -huh. um, we're talking about craft that might be different, but um, mm -hmm. we're talking about like painting. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of really specific things that people expect and want. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great, yeah, really codified, whether it be say higher, yeah. Yeah, great, thank you. Anything else? Okay, all right, well, we'll keep things going. Uh, now we have a, a, a new panel uh, based on um, a different, uh, uh, under the title of uh, Expanding Objects and <coughs> Expanding Craft, something like that. What did I say? <laughs> uh, but, uh, and also have um, two uh, luminaries in, um, in that expanded field, uh, 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 also with um, Brody Ryman serving as moderator. Um, and I'm going to turn this over to Brody to help introduce the next panel. Thank you, Brody. Chicago-based artist, urban planner, musician, cultural developer who works across museums, neighborhoods, and fiscal structures. His work considers the redemptive qualities of materials and neighborhoods, and his recent art objects focus on the topic of civil rights while also addressing abandonment and blight in poor communities throughout the Midwest. Converting abandoned buildings into cultural spaces that both allow for new cultural moments to happen in unexpected places the city's expectations of where placemaking happens and why. His work has been
been exhibited in the Museum of Contemporary Art Chicago, Los Angeles Museum of Contemporary Art, the Milwaukee Art Museum, and was included in last year's Whitney Biannual. He's also the director of Arts and Public Life and Artists in Residence at the University of Chicago. Allison Smith's diverse artistic practice draws upon the aesthetic and performative qualities of traditional craft, living history, and civic engagement in order to create temporary social formations in which contest, contested spheres of identity, labor, pedagogy, and are expanded and revealed. Allison received a BA in psychology from the New School for Social Research, a BFA in sculpture from Parsons School of Design, an MFA from the Yale University School of Art, and participated in the Whitney Museum Independent Study Program. Allison has produced solo exhibitions and projects for the Museum Contemporary Art Denver, San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, <coughs> Mildred Lane Kemper Art Museum, Berkeley Art Museum, Indianapolis Museum of Art, and has contributed her work to major museum surveys at Massachusetts Museum of Contemporary Art, Contemporary Arts Museum of Houston, which would be a name for contemporary <laughs> um, Andrew Warhol Museum, PS1 MoMA, Mattress Factory, and others. In addition, her storefront studio in Oakland is home to Smith's, a project that was inspired by the history of general stores and as an intimate place of exchange. She's also chair of the sculpture department at California College of Arts in San Francisco. So quite a panel. <laughs> um, Kim Yasuda is a public artist and professor of spatial studies at UC Santa Barbara since two, and, has, and since 2005 has served as co-director of the multi-campus research unit, UC Institute for Research in the Arts. She, is act, she has activated university teaching with her public arts research, developing initiatives that force partnership, partnerships between academic environs and the local slash regional communities in which they are situated, exploring potential intersections between a creative practice, knowledge production, and community development. Kim has collaborated with students and professionals on projects that include a public art plan for an, an affordable farm worker housing complex, the repurposing of shipping containers into mobile art studios, and the recent public art and participatory research projects in the com college community of Isla Vista, California. Through these proximity research field experiments, she established Friday Academy a temporary instructional environment within the university that maintains its own academic calendar and curricula to, con to conduct year-round off-site project-based learning experiments, a response to the critical need to retool existing institutional learning structures. Kim has, com has commissioned public works throughout California and has exhibited her installation work at venues including the Art Gallery of Ontario, Canada, Camera Work London, the New Museum of Contemporary Art in New York, the Whitney Museum of American Art Connecticut, and MIT List Visual Arts Center Boston. She is a recipient of two visual arts fellowships with the National Endowment of the Arts. So please join me in welcoming our panel. that the, the way that I'm able to um, 
extrapolate resources from really wealthy people by making these trinkets um, is, um, is really of value. So with that, um, I think that, that part of what I've tried to do at the same time that I'm uh, making these objects is, is attempting to ask what else can the objects do besides what they're a kind of called upon to do by the art world. That is, that they, they live in a gallery space for a little while, they live in a museum for a little while, they go into storage, they go to someone's home until it's asked to go to another museum, it goes to the museum. I die, it goes to Sotheby's. And, and that person is able to put a child in college, um, or they're able to sell one piaster to make room for three more young black emerging artists uh, uh, 20 years from now. Um, that it all, it all is kind of a big question. Uh, uh, and, it, and it's because it's a question that I, I think that I've gotten to the word expand. Because, because the thing itself, the object itself, the, the studio practice itself, wasn't really enough for me. And I could say the same thing about the black church. I could say the same thing about corporate America. That any of the silos of um, institutional letting and vetting, uh, individual silos failed me. And I found myself wanting to use um, the structures and institutions to some other service besides just my paycheck. Right? So, so that the institutions, all of the systems became in service to things that I really believe in. And, I, and so I'll show you objects, but really let's imagine the objects as vehicles by which I can get to another set of things that I really believe in. If, if that was the ambition of a, of a relational practice, um, then, then I would believe in it. But I don't exactly think that that was, that was the goal um, when, this, when the territory of relational aesthetics was, was built. I think that it was really about people trying to say, um, the, the act of engaging with people is art. Maybe so, but I don't really care. Um, and I, I, don't, I don't really want superficial engagements with people like that, you know. That I, what I'm after really is like, if I'm the only one who's making a little bit more cash on my block, um, I want to figure out how to use this object so that more of us can make more money on my block. So that's one way of expanding. If I have access to a certain kind of institutional research-based knowledge and other people who are my partners, who are friends of mine, don't have access to that same information because I got the job and they don't, then I want to try to open up that library that you need a particular kind of library card to, to make more room for more of the people who I get down with. And I want to try to ensure as often as I can that the people I get down with aren't just the people who already have library cards. So I find myself having to be really intentional in how I spend my day. So that uh, 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 people are built into it. And, and, and people who can benefit from the leveraging that we can do as artists and cultural people and institutional workers, they should be able to benefit from this stuff. So I, I think that when I think of the word expanding in relationship to objects, I think about it in ways like that. So, so at, some, at some point, 10 years ago, I made a lot of pots. I really enjoyed firing them in wood kilns and soda kilns. And let's say just, and I'm going to try to frame all of this with the words object and expansion in mind. That, that um, uh, being a craftsman was enough for a time. It did everything it was supposed to do. Um, it, it satisfied me. It created a real community of makers. I, I was clear about where I was in the hierarchy of clay, where I was failing. I knew who the greats were. Um, I could sell a bowl uh, for $55. I had gotten up to $55 for a nice little bowl. And I, I think I had sold a teapot for $200. And I was really excited about that. Um, Clay had allowed me this universal language to, to go around the world and to talk to people uh, in, in countries 
where their skill was like mine. It was another language, and where I, I didn't speak Japanese fluently, um, I was really good um, with 14-day wood fire kilns, large nabori gamas. I was into it. Um, I, um, in the context of this talk, though, if we were to just think about, say, how my practice has changed from seven years ago. Seven years ago, the object was enough. Today, I'd like to create um, Seoul Manufacturing Corporation, which is a, 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 a corporation that will bring Chinese, Japanese potters to the States, train black, untrained potters to make production wear, ceremonial soul food wear. But, We'll take this old abandoned warehouse in my neighborhood and we'll like trick out hundreds of thousands of pots. And our first goal is uh, there are four Japanese, three Japanese potters in Chicago right now who are just working with me um, to um, make this first line of ceremonial wear that will be dedicated to this space. Because part of what I'm interested in is how do I uh, activate this particular place in Chicago. So we're going to build a little soul food pavilion. And collectors will want to buy these objects, but they'll be unavailable to collectors. They'll be the property of a soul food pavilion. And the only way that you get to um, benefit from the object is by coming to the place. Right? So instead of the object being in service to an economy, in this, in this case, the objects are in service to, to uh, the people who live on my block. And they're in service to the meal. And that, and that the, What's great is that it'll get a whole team of folk who would never want to come to my block. And, and there's some seduction in that, right? So the, the, the art making has shifted from just being concerned with the, the object um, as, a, as a thing of commerce to, a, to, a, to the object as a thing of kind of like uh, curiosity and speculation and maybe an object as seduction. An object um, as a way of attempting to help me make a place a make, a, make a place that's been imagined as not having much value, um, have more value. Uh, a lot of the work that, I, that uh, I've done in the past has often tried to uh, think about my history with, so it's, it's always interesting when um, who you've been in the past looks very, very different from who you are in the future. And some people are really cool at um, unreconciling those things, kind of, you know, I'm from Altoona, Iowa, and you know, there's nothing in Altoona, Iowa. But there's a way in which black poverty um, was something that I was so <laughs> conscious of growing up. Um, it's something that you know, all of us uh, on my block really wanted to escape. And I think a lot of us thought, when we leave our block, all of the things that were stigmatized and um, um, about the west side of Chicago or all the things that seemed wrong about our block. This would be our opportunity once we have our good day jobs and we have business suits. This would be an opportunity for us to kind of let those things go. And so nobody wants to eat watermelon, you know? And it's like, the Japanese really love suikai. It's like, no one thinks about watermelon with this social stigma. But there's this way in which um, you forget about things. And, and the black church, uh, for me, had been one of those things that I really struggled with. How do I bring the black church forward um, uh, in this contemporary art practice that I have? In the same way, how do I bring clay forward uh, uh, into this, this contemporary art project that I've found myself in? And I, I want to talk about that. And so I, I, I um, when asked, um, in space was one way that I could do that. That when I was asked by this small gallery in St. Louis called Boots to come and do a show, uh, uh, the area where they were had been uh, historically African American. It was kind of new hipster style, uh, kind of an antique role. I found out that there was a church called uh, Mount Olive, the Missionary Baptist Church, that had been uh, uh, on that street, and that they had moved to the black side of town. They had moved to North St. Louis. I um, made this show with objects that were from my backyard, some old timbers, some things. I got to the boots made some things, and then I called up um, uh, Sister Johnson and asked Sister Johnson if her and the choir could come and bless the night, bless my objects, uh, uh, 
you know, and, and perform. Uh, I had also asked the gallerist, uh, who comes to your shows? And he was like, well, it's largely students from, you know, Washington University, and, you know, there's a larger artist community. It was all white, y'all, really white, like this room. White, white, <laughs> white. <laughs> so white. And, um, and what happened that night was um, the, 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 the choir members came, and they were a little nervous, and it was kind of this black choir, and this, these white people. But then, you know, St. Louis is also kind of a religious belt, right? And so there were some older um, folk in the audience, and I didn't expect this to happen, but when they started singing Ship of Zion, tis the old ship of, that there were, you know, like this one right here, she was rocking out. She was like old school Southern Pentecostal. And then there was this other, this other thing that had happened um, as a result of not just accepting the gallery. Uh, I could have either said, I'm an artist and my job is to bring objects to this gallery. Or I could ask a couple more questions of the gallery, like what existed here? Who else comes here? Who used to live here? Right? And, and by, by doing that, it became not only a moment to celebrate these objects, but also to celebrate these layers of history, right? That, that the building was the thing that had stayed. The building, in this case, became the monument, and then culture was kind of constantly moving through it. I, I can't make black people stay in a place. I can't change federal policy that would uh, 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 halt gentrification. I can't do those things, but what I can do is uh, accept that this monument is filled with layers and layers and try to bring some of those layers back to these abandoned buildings, formerly abandoned buildings. Um, I really like this, this um, image because um, this, these objects, these brown wooden boards are from uh, uh, the Wrigley's Chewing Gum Factory. Uh, you know, I've talked about this a little bit. The, the boards, they were conveyor pallets and would, would help um, as the chewing gum would shrink, if the, the gum could cure, and then a knife would split them, and then they get packaged. Them up. There were 10,000 of them. At the factory I got out of business uh, 20 years prior, I got the boards, and started kind of playing with the boards over a, a couple of years, a few years, as, as, uh, as my new clay. I couldn't afford my clay studio, it became my new clay. And I would just kind of use the boards like clay. I would kind of transform with them. I built this space um, to be kind of a sh monastic space. And after I built it, it I realized that um, the space was really right for performance. Uh, and so uh, as a result, I uh, uh, created a group called the Black Monks of Mississippi. Because it just felt like something monastic, ecstatic, charismatic needed to happen in the space. Right? So, so again, uh, object and expansion, it was this wooden wear board that helped me understand that I needed a performance arm to my practice that could um, kind of inhabit spaces, right? And so through the Black Monks and through thinking about ritual, I found myself uh, um, wanting to revisit not only materiality in, 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 in uh, the communities that I had grown up in, but also what are the daily rituals that happen? And so things like street sweeping and garbage pickup, um, uh, shoe shining, uh, forms of affection, um, uh, the, the thug, stroll, how one walks. Those things became really interesting to me. And that for a young uh, Latino, uh, African-American uh, male without a job uh, who may or may not have finished high school, um, a lot of your day is uh, kind of hanging out with the homies and walking. I wanted to think about things like that as these kind of um, seemingly informal rituals, but nonetheless, rituals that happen for a lot of people every day. You know, uh, and I, I wanted to, in this way, give care to those rituals as a, as a way of redeeming myself, as a way of redeeming a personal history. That, um, uh, by, by pronouncing that these rituals are important, therefore, I will walk my block. Um, and, and that it, it not only is qualified for me, but it's qualified for the other brothers and sisters who walk and hang and loiter, if you will. And that if I could start this conversation with other folk around the value of the ritual of walking, that might be really interesting. Right? So 
So I started asking, as museums would ask me to do things, I would say, well, yeah, just, here's, here's the object, but this object is in service to people. And so is there a way that we can expand what you imagine uh, this exhibition needs to be? So I'll deliver um, the temple to the Museum of Contemporary Art. But the temple is only uh, uh, half-baked if we're not able to activate that space, right? And that that activation can't just be um, whoever walks into your doors. It has to be much more intentional than that. And so how do we in intentionally use this object, intentionally use this moment, to reimagine what the museum could, could offer people who don't normally imagine themselves wanting to go to a museum. Like, could, could I deliver a, a music product um, that you know, Pastor Cooper would be proud of, or my mom might want to come to, or uh, may, may allow me to then ask questions of the larger cultural community that doesn't, the musical community in Chicago that maybe doesn't go to museums and is really disconnected from the visual arts. I could have them be present with me, and we can rock out. And so we, you know, we rocked out. <laughs> and it went from the Museum of Contemporary Art, and the object went to the Whitney Biennial in 2010. And, and, and then I found myself in this interesting place of like trying to figure out um, uh, the relationship between um, a performance, a performative gesture that is, is, is temporal, and the, and the object is really trying to be a token to another set of things that live in the real world. So I, I made a shoe shine stand so that people would want to go to Shine King, right? But then the shoe shine stand had value because my relationship to the art world started to shift and started to take on this new value. So where this token that was meant to only point people to my history this token all of a sudden had this other cultural, uh, psychic, um, political, financial charge to it. Uh, and it went this other way to do this other thing. And, and, and as a result, um, um, the, the chair, the, the throne, the shoeshine stand expanded. Right? That, that it, it had the capacity both to kind of reflect our community and then kind of live, live in this, in this uh, uh, art economy. That in some ways, what I really, what I hope, what I hope would happen would be the, the thing that would happen in my studio, which were these, you know, no different from any of our practices, these formal gestures, trying to figure out what can I do with all these damn wearboards, you know, how do I get this sugar crap off of them? Um, how, how might I present these that they might love me, that they might come to imagine me uh, even as Carl Andre, even as... Gordon Matter Park, even, you know, how, how can I get connected, right, to, 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 to uh, uh, I only want it so bad to be loved, <laughs> you know, to, to, to be accepted by the ceramic community, you know, and so I would try to make a, a mug like the mug on the front of Ceramics Monthly. I only want it to be loved by the contemporary art world. You know, I want John Legend to love you. So, <laughs> that, that the, the objects that came from a black neighborhood that one might call all black was in fact um, a neighborhood filled with otherness. Merchant activity. Um, Folk who quietly live among us. I wanted to kind of explore that geography, the, that territory, that my neighborhood actually ain't all black. And that the Chinese restaurant is complicated. It sells chicken wings, you can get your shoes shine, you can send a fax, you know. And, and that kind of, uh, and it's, the, it's the only, it's the only uh, uh, merchant exchange spot on the block. So, you know, they figured it out. That, that even with, with Shine, I was able to engage um, this, this failing Chinese restaurant to become part of my soul food ceremonial arm. Say, look, y'all, 
Y'all bring my sister on to cook the collard greens. Y'all already make a mean barbecue chicken wing. You know, can we expand how we imagine greens and bok choy to do this other thing? Can we, can we think about those ingredients? And every Sunday, when y'all don't get any, can we switch your menu every Sunday? But, but trying to really think about how, how can I both have affect in the, in the museum world, but also use that same kind of creative energy to kind of reimagine what a Chinese restaurant does in a black neighborhood. And, and not say, I wish this was a black owned business, but if you're going to be here, can't you have a different kind of relationship with, the, with your neighbors? Can we expand how you imagine it, right? So that I, that I feel like the, the object making part is actually, I wouldn't say it's the simple part, but it's the part that it, it begins with objects and then it goes somewhere uh, for me. That, that um, my friends who are musicians and that, they were, they were really curious, like, yeah, so what's all this shit happening at the MCA and, you know, what's this biennial thing? And I was like, y'all, you gotta, y'all gotta help me out. You know, y'all gotta uh, do stuff with me. Um, and I was just, you know, not, not unlike Mark Bamuti Joseph, just trying to say, how do I get more of the people who I care about um, connected to this cultural activity that is just happening right next to them, like the, but, it, but it doesn't include them. And how do I get my homies around? Because I just want to be around my homies sometimes. I'm going to end with uh, this one project uh, uh, at the Milwaukee Art Museum. We, uh, the museum asked me to make a work about um, uh, this potter named Dave Slade Potter. Made pots, and his hot pots were in the 1850s. And I decided that I would take this idea of an expanded practice and expand and, and concentrate on this one pot and try to freak, I would just try to freak that pot every way I could. <laughs> University of Chicago had given me their glass lantern slide collection. The art history department was doing. So I basically was able to do a survey of my history of ceramics via this, uh, this glass lantern slide collection. I built a 200 voice gospel choir. Um, uh, that took a year. We, we made, Dave became my librettist, and, uh, and, and I made this music for Dave. I, I embodied Dave. Uh, um, and then I was able to spend time at the Kohler Manufacturing Corporation, which is in Milwaukee, kind of a site specific one. I thought, if we're going to, you know, if you want to know about uh, slave production, or a family-owned business where craftsmen are making money for a family, and we at the Milwaukee Art Museum go to fucking Kohler. Like, you know, it's a, it's, they still own over 51%, you know, and a lot of the stuff is outsourced, and I bet these retiring um, white union workers have more in common with Dave than I do. Right. And so I was there for three months getting to know these brothers, and their stories, and they were third and fourth generation toilet makers, and third and fourth generation glazers, and third and fourth generation like inventory people. Um, it was really interesting, and I found that 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 they did in fact have more in common with Dave than I did. Um, but I thought I would end with um, some of the music that came out of that, and just to say, you know, like it it started with play, and then this. This clay production ended in music. That it, it no longer needed the object at all to complete the work. Uh, I might mess this up. I messed it up. Let me try again. Play the current slide. Maybe not that one. Gosh darn it. Okay, I'll show you another one. Come on up here, big girl. We'll show the one from. Um, yeah, let's do that one. So, this is the Milwaukee Art Museum.
felt really marginal to the Milwaukee Art Museum. And, they, the, and the museum was saying, you know, this is great, the Astro, we really want you to come and help us like, engage these communities. I said, Kohler is the community that you need to engage. Relative to my practice, I'm much more interested in these colored workers who are producing ceramic objects than I am just being, you know, if this is about my art practice, this is not the black moment. But as a result of this engagement, and when I decided that I wanted to make this Dave hymnal, I found that uh, one of the ways that I could directly engage the community is to say, look, I really like uh, uh, singing. I would really love to have this work performed. I need help. I don't need a friend. I don't need a hug. Um, it, it wasn't a relational practice in like, let's be warm and fuzzy. It was like, let's do some work together. You know, and uh, these five churches in Milwaukee were really, really happy to, to be asked to think about how the form, how the, how the vehicle of the gospel sound might be used with different language to do a totally different thing. Uh, thank you guys for your time. Uh, Tinkerer, 
He makes model airplanes and miniature steam engines, is a prolific kite maker, and actually his job is designing secret spy equipment for the Central Intelligence Agency. Although I didn't know it until I was a teenager, uh, he was involved in tradecraft, or the art of international espionage. But that's a secret. <laughs> but while I'm telling you some secrets, though, I should also mention that when I was in six years old, we, re we moved to a remote military compound in Iran and lived there for several months until we were abruptly evacuated um, on the eve of the Iranian Revolution. I was told never to speak of this time, even though it contains some of my most vivid childhood memories. I had no idea until after September 11th uh, that what my father had been doing there. Um, and I only learned recently from my friend, the artist Trevor Paglin, um, that where we lived was actually a black site. In other words, a location that the US government uh, denies even existed. I'm also from one of many families in the American South for whom the Civil War never really ended. Uh, my ancestors had cotton plantations, and um, these were off the coast of Charleston. Uh, two of my ancestors signed the secession of South Carolina, which sparked the war. Um, another skeleton in my, my closet. Um, and speaking of closets, I also knew uh, from a pretty young age that I was more attracted to girls than boys, and I came out when I was 16. So between this kind of constricting uh, outward gentility that was cultivated by my mom, and the inward fear and anxiety that I felt toward my dad. Um, you could say that I know a thing or two about surveillance. Um, I felt a very acute sense of being watched, um, but I also began to spy back. Uh, at 18, I left home for New York to go to art school. This was the early 90s, and I was most inspired by the work of feminists and queer activists and also artists of color who were making work about identity politics and in particular, this notion of the performativity of identity. Um, alongside uh, my degree in the fine arts, I pursued a, um, a second degree in psychology. I read Judith Butler voraciously and went to a lot of drag shows, um, and I decided to conduct my own ethnography of the Civil War reenacting community, almost like um, being an indigenous anthropologist trying to study my home society, but with all of the, the attendant, you know, um, problems <laughs> with that. Um, studying art taught me how to be critical. Uh, studying psychology taught me how to be compassionate. Um, and I started developing a thesis that Civil War reenactors were acting out these kind of um, culturally, um, these sort of cultural traumas, unresolved cultural traumas, um, through meticulously handcrafted props. If any of you know reenactors or have or know anything about reenactment, you're probably aware of the attention to detail, the number of stitches on the sole of a boot, you know the exact material, you have thread counting um, when it comes to trying to get the material culture of reenactment together in order to to effectively enable time travel. Um, so this offered a way to you know look at my own family, my own background, my own identity from this oblique angle, and also to try to think about this endless loop, uh, which we seem to be caught within. Um, as a grad student, I visited um, a plantation that was once owned by a uh, Confederate kin on Edisto Island, which is now B&B. Um, had to pay to stay there. Um, and documented some graffiti that was left on the walls by Northern troops who had occupied the house during the Civil War. Um, so this is like the moment of rupture for my ancestors. Um, I transformed these uh, drawings into a wall pattern that um, was like a masculine drawing room interior. Um, and I invited um, a Civil War reenactor to actually come and pose in front of, in front of this wall. Um, the drawings happened to have taken the form of boats, and this reenactor was able to identify every boat, the function of the boat, the regiment that would have been there at the time, and he actually wore the uniform that they, that they would have worn. Um, while he was visiting uh, my studio, I, ha I had a moment where I was, you know, um, you know, here's this guy, and he's got this big gun, and, you know, this rifle, um, with a very sharp bayonet, 
on it, and I and I wondered, you know, what I was doing, inviting this this stranger into my studio. But then he started to re to recount a story about having been asked to lay the reeds on um, some some um, Civil War soldiers' graves, and that he had been chosen to uh, read the names out. And when he recounted the story to me, he began to cry. Um, this is Bill Max. Uh, he is reenacting here as the first sergeant of the 4th U.S. Regular Infantry, um, and he's also a Vietnam War veteran. Um, historical reenactment or living history is founded on the idea that historical events gain meaning and relevance when performed live in an open air, interactive setting. Um, but as a history making institution, I wondered how I might subject it to institutional critique and in effect live in it so as to expose history itself as a contestable field. Who writes history, who performs, who directs? Um, and can you ever really look away from that process without someone else taking it up in your place? Um, I've been making period room-like installations and functional objects that in many ways were sculptural forms of reenactment until in 2004 I decided to try and organize my own large-scale uh, reenactment. But instead of pitting two sides against each other and kind of directing an event for which the outcome was already predetermined, I decided to organize this event around a question, which is, uh, what are you fighting for? I call this event, it turned into a series of events, um, I, I call this event uh, the muster, uh, which is a military term for the gathering of the troops for the purposes of inspection, critique, exercise, and display. Um, and I invited everyone that I knew to uh, fashion uniforms, build campsite installations, and to gather together publicly to proclaim their, their causes. In 2005, um, for the Armory Show in New York, this big art fair that happens there every year, I was able to set up my own roadside recruiting station. Um, I made over 100 wooden rifles, muskets, and sabers based on weapons used during the Civil War, but obviously rendered in, in Technicolor. And, uh, if collectors were interested in purchasing these weapons, they had to enlist in my cause by signing a volunteer enlistment form based on those used uh, during the Civil War. Um, they had to acknowledge that they were voluntarily arming themselves with art. They had to promise to be defenders of, of art. But also they had to agree to muster into action when called um, to, to battle. Um, I was able to um, work on the, the largest of the, the musters that I did with uh, an organization in Europe called the Public Art Fund. Um, and I was very lucky to, um, to have been able to do this project on Governor's Island, which is an island in uh, New York Harbor. Um, it was a military base for over 200 years. It played a, it played a role in every war uh, in the US historically. Um, and it was actually sold to the people of New York uh, for one U.S. dollar uh, several months before this, this event took place. And it was a time when a lot of arts institutions were trying to figure out who was going to get to use um, this island and for what purposes. Um, for this, I worked with the Governor's Island um, Education and Preservation Corporation, the National Park Service. There, I learned a lot of skills in working with, you know, how do we get ferries to this island? How do we, um, how do we get, you know, firefighters and, and those kinds of things? And there were some really interesting uh, conversations because I wrote a broadside that invited people to, you know, take their shirts off and to go into soldier drag and all these other things. And, and so it was an interesting negotiation with, uh, with a historic site that was also a monument and was a military site. Um, this island was also in the shadow of the Twin Towers, so it was, a, it was a, it, a place that felt like you were really going somewhere, but at the same time it gave you this new view on Lower Manhattan. Um, for the muster, there were about 125 enlisted participants and over 2,000 spectators. Um, in terms of what people were mustering for, there was an extremely wide range from grassroots uh, political organizations, fighting to end AIDS, fighting for ocean con conservation, things like that. Um, there was a very uh, strong and radical feminist and queer, uh, gender queer and trans contingent that was there alongside uh, Civil War reenactors, military families who had lived on the island before. Um, and I was really interested in, in, in trying to bring together these very 
different kinds of, uh, of communities and, and to see what, what could happen in that space. Um, my role as the kind of mustering officer was not so much to direct the event, but to be a gatherer, almost more of a cheerleader type. I had a, you know, my megaphone, and I was really, it was really high energy. I just wanted everyone to feel like they could be, you know, whatever, whatever they needed to, to say or do or present in that, in that, um, in that moment. And at the time, I was really um, interested in this idea of the amateur citizen soldier, and I had been doing, doing a lot of research on early American militia groups and these kind of really flamboyant, eccentric uniforms that they had made for themselves, and I was interested in that idea of kind of getting up and saying, you know, what you need to say. Um, this was also at the height of the red state-blue state divide, um, and, you know, obviously conflicts uh, in the Middle East, so those, those themes ran through a lot of the, the projects uh, that were there. Um, I was trying to invoke um, moments of queer mustering, like the Stonewall Rebellion, the Gay Pride Parade, things like that. Um, and I was really interested in this idea of proclamation over protest. Not that protest isn't completely um, necessary and um, important, but I was interested in trying to create a space where people would try to think beyond um, protest, something that they would feel was worth fighting for. And that was an awkward question. That was a difficult question for a lot of people. Um, so there were about 50 campsites. Um, a couple of examples. This one is a campsite by a woman named uh, Gail Brown and her uh, collaborator, Marcus Milius. Gail interpreted the question, what are you fighting for, in terms of personal battles. Um, she was fighting for forgiveness. And she built this campsite on stilts like the, that resembles the bow of a boat. Um, she created uniforms based on the striping used for American flags, and she and Marcus wrote songs about feelings of shame and guilt over America's involvement in, uh, in conflicts in the Middle East. Um, this is Brian Purcell. He was fighting for the power of pink uh, and all things sweet and girly. Um, he actually worked with the seamstress to recreate a Civil War uniform all out of pink cloth. Um, in his tent, you could have your hair braided with ribbons, you could have your nails polished, you could talk about feelings and relationships. Um, very popular with the 13 and under. <laughs> um, another really great project was, um, was by a knitwear designer and professor of Rhode Island School of Design, she, uh, Liz Collins. She created a knitting army, and they actually brought manually powered knitting machines onto the battlefield and knit yardage of material, yardages of material right out onto the battlefield, while uh, an art historian um, Julia Bryan Wilson read songs from the, the Civil War about the, um, the knitting craze. And I learned from Liz that there has been a knitting craze throughout every historic uh, war, um, and including the current, um, current conflicts, uh, although historically these were tied to making socks and mittens for soldiers, and now we just have, we still have the need to do something with, uh, with anxious hands, but um, less of a connection, clearly, to, to the front lines. So they knit this enormous uh, American flag that was lounged on, stepped on, snagged, tattered, repaired, and finally ceremoniously folded back into the tricorn pattern that's traditional for flags. Um, there, were, there were other pieces that I made around that time. I, I, um, I have made a lot of sculptures that are inspired by 19th century toys or that in some way try to play with um, the notion of civic sculpture as, as something one can inhabit or play with or bring down or ride on um, and uh, to activate in different ways. Um, this is a, a hobby horse uh, sculpture that actually rocks. And um, for this, this was uh, made in the context of a residency at, at Art Case in San Antonio, Texas. Um, and uh, I did a performance on this. Um, it was the only time I ever sang, and I, 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 I will never do it again. <laughs> but I sang a song that was, um, that was uh, based on the very famous Civil War battle, uh, When Johnny Comes Marching Home, which you probably heard. I, I, I learned that that song, which is all about kind of rallying around the returning soldier um, to make him feel, you know, good that, um, feel good for his service. 
Um, I learned that that song was based on an earlier Irish folk ballad, also about Johnny the Soldier returning home, but having lost a limb and having had to uh, hold a bowl out, you know, to beg for money. And, and the song was really a sad lament on the horrors of any war. Um, and so in my re reworked version of this song, I talked about not uh, knowing when or if soldiers ever could come home. And so writing on this happy horse was, was, was about sort of this state of cultural impasse, kind of being you know, on this thing and wanting to move forward, but feeling almost lulled, like a lullaby, sort of lulled into a kind of limbo um, present. Um, I've, I've, like I said, a lot of these sculptures were um, based on toys. Um, I did a series of more, more of these kind of wooden rifle pieces, more large-scale pull toys uh, that I used in parades and other projects. Um, I, um, I see these as kind of emblematic and, and toy-like, um, but also you, you'll notice in a lot of my work there's this kind of radiant quality to the installations that I create. Um, because I'm always trying to uh, to draw people in. Um, this is this is probably the last exhibition that I did um, that was uh, that was solely kind of still sculptures, and um, this was in 2005. And, I, and at that time, I was still thinking of these as functional objects. But my idea of what, how an object could function was really expanding at that time. So I was thinking, you know, I want to do these portraits of obscure people who lived during the Civil War whose stories aren't told and who are never reenacted. Um, people who, women who passed as men um, to, to fight in the war. People who were fighting on both sides, spies, you know, things like that. Um, and so I worked with uh, craftspeople. Um, I was teaching and, and, and uh, traveling uh, in France at this time in my life uh, quite a bit, and I would work with a family to create this series of, of porcelain dolls. And they, they start with uh, impressions from my own body, but they, um, they have glass eyes and, and sewn wigs and these kind of hand-sewn uniforms that I, that I made with, um, with someone who, who makes uniforms for the reenactment world um, as a way of trying to sort of get into the psychology of, of how these things are, uh, these forms are inhabited and these objects are engaged. Um, I, 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 in terms of skills, I am someone who constantly wants to learn new skills. Um, I think that my work hinges on people skills, but, um, but I'm really um, inspired by and really interested in uh, learning a, a range of, of skills. Um, I think of myself as, a, as definitely a master of none, and I think that was one of the things I took from art school was that, you know, it's, um, you know, not important to be um, the master, um, but more, I'm more sort of the, the jack of all trades, trying to bring things together. Um, I think Mark Diane once said the original meaning of the word dilettante was someone interested in everything. And I, and I see myself, um, I see myself that way. Um, but it's very much about the conversation. This is a series of overshot blankets woven by um, a weaver in Charleston, South Carolina. These take a pattern um, called Lee's Surrender which I thought was really fascinating, that there is a pattern in textiles called the surrender um, to mark the end of the Civil War, um, but then placed in a field at the center is a, is a, um, um, a field of proliferating oil barrels. I worked with a, a potter in uh, Pittsburgh, um, Pennsylvania. For, this was a project for the mattress factory where basically I collaborated with him on a series of, uh, of wares where we would sit and he would teach me he would try to teach me how to uh, throw a pot um, while we talked about things in current events that, that filled us with anxiety. So we made um, you know, over 100 different vessels that came out of you know, talking about the news, talking about the war, talking about um, you know, these kind of buzzwords. And I was um, interested in, in this whole